Greetings, everyone. Um, I, I'd actually con considered having Dallas uh, say, now appearing as Chris Turner, Ryan North. So uh, <laughs> the reason you don't hear Chris's voice is because Chris uh, and Kelly are across the country and have taken their oldest to move into his dorm room as he starts his freshman year in college. Um, and so I'm kind of okay with that. As much as I miss, like Chris and miss Chris and wish he was here, uh, I'm kind of okay with that. Because not only on the podcast in this episode is the lovely Kayla North joining me Hello. as always. <laughs> but, but we get to have all to ourselves one of our absolute favorite human beings. Um, you are just an absolute darling of a person, and um, I don't care that everybody who listens to this knows that we love you, Miss <laughs> Jelana Gobel. Welcome. Thank you. The feeling is mutual, Ryan and Kayla. <laughs> one one of oh. our favorite conversations with Jelana, uh, well, one of any conversation with her ends with us reminiscing how we'd love to either live in Portland or have her and her family live in Dallas so we could sit on each other's back porches at night. Just. Yeah. Uh, and just that visit. Would be a dream. That would be awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That would be awesome. Well, uh, Jelana, before um, we just start talking, because I think we're just going to visit for a bit, uh, a couple of things uh, about that. And, and you know that I have apologized to you personally, but now I'm going to apologize to you publicly. Um, you, had a, <laughs> you had a book come out June 7th, so yeah. July. Yes. So it's a 10, like 10 or 11 weeks ago. So our humblest apologies yeah. for only sitting down and visiting with you now, but uh, A Love Stretched Life came out. and um, No need to apologize. You were early readers and you endorsed the book. <laughs> so I feel like you guys were in on it at the very beginning. I was thrilled that you said yes to read it. Mm, it was so good. It was one of those, like, as I was reading it, I was like, I don't want to put it down because I just want to, like, I mean, I'd heard you tell some of the stories before, but just reading it and hearing some of the stories of things you guys have been through, and um, it was just so good. I was, I was glad to get to read it. It wasn't just the things you guys had had been through, but it was some of the stuff that really that really, um, like I felt personally connected to. And I'll, and I'll get to story about that um, just a, a little bit later here while we're, while we're talking. So. Um, I, I don't know. What do you, do you want to introduce your family to everybody? Do you uh, just Sure. Floor is yours. So, I'm horrible at hosting you. podcasts, by the way. That's why Chris does it, because I'm like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> and Ken's like, I don't no, want to do it either. Not, you're okay. <laughs> so, um, so I have five children who call me mom. Um, I have two biological daughters and then three um, young men that have all come to me via the foster care system, none of whom are related to one another. Our oldest is named Royal. Um, he was our very first placement in foster care back when my husband, Luke and I were at the ripe old age of 25 and with zero parenting experience where they were like, you'd be great. And we're like, really? Would we? We were kind of flattered by that. <laughs> I look back and I just think, who stuck us with a six and a nine year old when we were 25 years old with zero parenting experience. But nevertheless, um, the nine-year-old through a series of circumstances wasn't able to stay, but we had the privilege of raising the six-year-old for Royal for his first grade year. Then through a series of circumstances, we lost touch. I, I talk about that more in depth in A Love Stretch Life. And then we reconnected six years ago when he was a 19-year-old young man um, after you know, spending a lifetime apart. And so that story is in a love stretch life. He's a big part of my life. It is certainly exposed me to what it looks like when someone is left to really bounce around in an overwhelmed dysfunctional child welfare system. And what happens when youth age out without, you know, the consistency of one caring adult. Um, then I have Sophia, who's 18, and Eleni, who's 15, and then Micah is 14, and Micah came to us at six months old, and I had the privilege of meeting his beautiful and incredible first mom, Jennifer, at Juvenile Court, and we have walked 13 years together. And then my youngest, who is 10, is Charlie. And Charlie was our, can you pick up a baby just for the weekend call from the Oregon <laughs> Child Welfare Hotline, to which we said yes. And surprise, surprise, he never left, much to our great joy. 
And also Charlie has really invited um, our family to really rumble with, with joy and grief because the parenting journey that we thought we were saying yes to is mm. very different from the parenting journey that we are living every single day with him. So that's my family. I've been married for 22 years to my best friend, Luke. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my family. Five kids between 10 and 25. So mm. we, we've met everybody except Royal. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, so, just if I can just tell briefly tell that story. We we went up to Portland four four years ago, four and a half years. Yeah, twenty eighteen. Like twenty eighteen, and mm-hmm. uh, and we and we land and and the place is covered in snow. And we were told at the time that it doesn't really snow that often in Portland. So so there, this is this is special. And then um, <laughs> you guys were nice enough to put us up in in a house. Um, uh, and all I remember about the house is that it was on a an incline. It's called the hillside house, Ryan. It's called the hillside house. <laughs> okay. So it was on a hill. On a thank hill. you. Thank you. I just thought it was my stress level that made that hill seem bigger. But uh, so, <laughs> so, 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 so we call. We call so, we, so we meet Yolanda the day we land, uh, and and then uh, on the way to dinner, she's like, "Hey, just stop by the house and meet the family." And so. Um, that was the first time, or not the first time, one of the only times in all the years we, we've traveled to speak that people have invited us into their home to, to meet their families. And so that always kind of sat, sat really special with us that, that you allowed us to, you thought enough of us to, to allow us to meet your people. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was kind of fun to do that. And then the next day we were going to the church and our Uber came and it, it like on the Hill House and the dude shows up like in a Honda Civic and I... I'm embarrassed to say I have not prayed that hard before or since that day, getting getting down <laughs> the street out of the neighborhood because I did not think we were going to make it. But, but props to that dude. He had mad snow driving skills. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, no, it's so true. Portland usually gets a dusting of snow maybe once, sometimes twice a year, but it's usually a dusting. But when you guys came, it was a legit snowfall. There was like legitimately- banks of snow on the side of the road. We were like, what awesome. is going on here? And we were yes. taking pictures of some of the snow. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was crazy. And um, that that hill, you know, it, it does transform into a sheet of ice. So you were probably <laughs> ice skating in that little tin car <laughs> some of the- down the hill. And some of that dude <laughs> maintained traction, and I and I have yeah. no idea. And he didn't so even seem things. bothered by it. Like he was just looked like he was driving, like it was, you know. A Sunday in June. Maybe um, he was from if, somewhere that it snows, and he was just excited maybe. to finally get to to drive somewhere in the yeah, snow. Maybe. Oh and my we gosh. loved having you in our house. Thank you. I mean, like, uh, thanks for even being willing to just walk through my front door and meet my family. It just mm, I feel like that's helped to cement our friendship. Mm, yeah, and, years, so. and then we also got to meet Luke, not just the kiddos. Yes. Uh, and. <laughs> And and so and so your family's from the West Coast, if I remember correctly, and his is from Correct. the East Coast. Correct. And and, yeah. and and Royal lives in New York now. He does. He he and, had a stint where he lived out in Portland, but he is back in Buffalo, New York, which is where we originally fostered him. Okay. So and, and so did you you got to see him recently. Now I'm I'm asking this like you didn't tell me this earlier today when we spoke on the phone. <laughs> no, so, but, it's totally fine. So yeah, Jelana, no, did you see Royal least recently in New York? <laughs> I did. I did. Thank you for asking, Ryan. Um yeah, we just got back from two weeks in New York. We we try to go back there pretty often to see Luke's family. All three of his siblings live back there. Um and we were able to to connect with Royal and um you know, we, we have no legal connection to Royal, but we refer to him as the son of son of our heart because he calls us mom and dad. Mm. And, and um, we, which is really an interesting thing because when he lived with us, he called us Mr. Luke and Miss Jelana. And we had no mm. other children in the house that were calling us anything differently. And we were totally fine with that. Um, so it felt very impactful when we reconnected with him at 19 and what's interesting, he has an he has an unusual name and so uh middle name as well and so royal storm um and he was a little little storm he was a little hurricane himself but luke had looked on and off for him um you know throughout the years and uh one night i just got this kind of Holy Spirit slash Sixth Sense slash Mama Bear instinct. And I was like, oh my goodness, where is 
Royal. Mm -hmm. And I looked him up and boom, there he was with a pick in his Afro, flipping off the camera, bloodshot eyes, holding a bottle of Hennessy. And it just looked like maybe life was not going super awesome for him in that moment. And then it's like, what do you say to somebody that you haven't really connected with since they were little? And I didn't want to appear like bizarre. And so it's like, how do you start off a, you know, a, a, a message? Um, so yeah. I just said, Royal, like, I'm not 100% sure it's you. I was pretty sure it was him. But, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to appear too confident and um, just said, but I, you know, I, you've really been strongly on my mind. I've had your July birthday circled on my calendar all these years. I just remember you as an amazing kid with a good heart who had way too much adult stuff on his plate to deal with. Mm. And, um, you know, I hope life has treated you well and miss you and, and it was short, it was short and sweet. And then the next day I woke up to all these missed, uh, calls through Facebook messenger and the message OMG with about 10 exclamation points. You're still dot, 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 my mom in all capital letters. And it was like, wait, what? And then a few hours later, Luke and I were huddled together on speakerphone in our bedroom. And he's like, mom, dad, is it really you? Mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, I feel like crying. And that's kind of what, what led us to, to start this road. And, you know, very quickly realized mm -hmm. I've had one mom and dad my entire life. The people who've told me that they love me have not left me. And here's a young man that has had many people filling the role of mom. Although Luke was the only male figure in his life mm. all throughout growing up. Um, so, you know, through the privilege of reconnecting with Royal, uh, he's, he's taught me a lot just through giving me the privilege of getting glimpses of his journey, which is not unlike, I think the journey of a lot of youth who, who exit foster care without a support system, very predictable, um, chain of events from, um, you know, getting in trouble in high school, going to the youth authority from the youth authority, getting in trouble there and going into, you know, mainstream incarceration, from incarceration, getting released to absolute nothingness um, and being told, okay, you're, you're felon now and you need to stay in this little county where you don't know anyone to him ultimately absconding and essentially being a runaway. And I didn't know all of that when we first reconnected. It took him a while for him to, you know, feel comfortable sharing the truth of that situation, which by the way, I have his full permission to be, you know, sharing this piece of his story. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, it, it, it's certainly made those statistics come alive that yeah. we know mm -hmm. are true, you know, for, for youth that exit foster care. Well, we don't always get to know the rest of the story as foster parents, you know, like sometimes they leave our house and we never know. Um, and we, right. We have no connection later on, so we don't know what happens to them or where they go or how many homes they bounce yeah. around to and from, you know? I mean, we've we fostered a bunch of kiddos and, um, you know, the first kiddo that left our house, I still think about him on a regular basis. Um, you know, we have an ornament that we put on our tree for him and he was 18 months old when he left, you know, like he... He, but he made such an impression on us. Now we did, we have gotten to see him over the years. Um, we got to see him probably for the last time we saw him. Gosh, he was probably eight or nine years old. Um, and he's now, he just turned 13 in June. So, oh, wow. um, you know, it's been a few years since we've gotten to see him, but we were thankful like his, he went to live with a great aunt and uh, she kept in touch with us, you know, sporadically. She would send me a, a picture and say, hey, he started first grade, you know, or, mm -hmm. or hey, this is a picture I took at his birthday party. And we were invited to a few birthday parties early on. Um, but, yeah, it's he's one of the few that we've gotten to, like, actually know a little bit. Um, we have another one, you know, another kiddo that we um, fostered who I'm actually – friends with her mom on Facebook now. And so um, she went to a great aunt and uncle who adopted her. And so I actually get to see pictures of her pretty regularly, but haven't seen her in person in years. Um, mm. 
but you know, you don't, you just never know. You never know where they're going to go just... or what's going to happen, you know? Exactly. Yeah, no, totally. I do know. And I mean, that is the case with the majority of the kids that we fostered. So it just yeah. feels like an extra gift that Royal was our very first kiddo. Yeah. We are so um, in such close touch. I mean, we really mm-hmm. claim um, one another solidly as family. Yeah. And I think something that was so interesting to me is, you know, looking back, hearing hearing his own reflections about that time that he lived with us. And part of me was like ready to hear about like the trip to Disneyland. Like we flew to California. We went to San Francisco. We went to Disneyland. We did, we did some pretty big Mm. things, the new bike on Christmas day, you know, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And really, while he remembered that the thing he talked about were like the grilled cheese sandwich. He remembered me making grilled cheese Mm -hmm. and us sitting around the table as a family. He remembered his lunchbox. He remembered the Spider-Man poster on the wall. And these were just like pretty humble, ordinary things. He he said things like, Mom, remember that time that we had people over and to watch football and we had chip and dip? And it's like, oh my gosh. You know, for most families, right. that is not like a, something that you would remember as like a core right. memory of your entire childhood. But he's like, that was awesome. You know, so I think Mm -hmm. for me, it's been um, impactful to hear his reminiscing and to hear about these little ordinary things. And he says, well, you know, mom, like when your whole life is like a storm, you can sometimes remember the calm. And this was the calm. Mm -hmm. So uh, pretty, pretty powerful. Yeah. I I love that you mentioned the grilled cheese there because, because I think what, what, what I heard in all of that was, you never know what's going to matter, right? And cause, exactly. Because we think it's the trips to Disneyland that matter. Right, But But it's right. the sitting around the grilled cheese at the dinner table that has the lasting impact. Mm-hmm. And I think that we, I think that often we take the small moments for granted. And and your story just reminded me what, what a mistake that is. Now, mm-hmm. um, Jelana, we could literally talk for 12 hours because... We could. Think, <laughs> like there's a bunch of things that I wanted to say about about that that story. I, I want to say about that story, and um, you know, and then we should just like once every six weeks just have Jelana on Kayla, and just, and just, and just <laughs> so I'll turn us. Sorry, we just we're just visiting with our friend, and we let everybody hear it. Um, but there was something else, and and and, and I want we Kayla and I both um, want everybody to buy this book because you're awesome. Um, you you know that 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 we uh, that we'd love you dearly, but reading the story the story that I'm about to, about to bring up, I'd like you to talk about a little more. When I read this in the book, oh my gosh, I moved from from loving Jelana Gobel to being being reminded why I love Jelana Gobel for co- for a couple of reasons, and I just want you to tell the story, and then and then I want to circle back to that. Uh, but there's a story in the book, M- Micah, who is now 14. Um, when he was when he was what six months old so it's way back at the beginning of the story and and you go to a court hearing and you meet his birth mom jennifer i do and it was my first opportunity to ever engage with a, a parent a child welfare involved parent um so I show up at court and, you know, at least in Oregon, you put all your stuff through a metal detector, you go upstairs, everybody's kind of whispering. I like to say it, it reminds me of the worst of junior high because people are standing in little clump circles waiting to go through the double doors of court and they're all kind of like whispering to one another. And so I was standing with um, uh, child welfare initially and I just said, is that Jennifer? And they were like, oh, we don't really know. And I saw this woman with this disheveled bun and I thought maybe she, she probably, that's probably his mom. And so I walked up to her with this eight by 10 photograph, which was a total impromptu grab. I, on the way to court, there was an eight by 10 framed photograph of her child sitting on my piano. And I just felt like this this conviction of like, this is her child. I need to give her this. Mm. And so I arrived frame and all with that photograph. And I just said, hi, are you Jennifer? And she said, I am. I said, well, I'm Jelana and I'm Micah's foster mom. Nice to meet you. And I brought you this and she took it and she just started crying. And I found myself like wrapping my arms around her and just saying like, I just want to let you know 
that I'm rooting for you. That was not planned. That was so genuine, but that was not planned. Um, you know, we had had Micah for a few months at that point, and the, the the child sweat profusely to the point where I took him to the pediatrician and I just said, it looks like we have dunked him in the bathtub. Why is his hair so wet all the time? And she just said, this is one of the most profound um, outward signs of uh, external signs of stress that I have seen. She said, mm. um, and, and we would go into Micah's room. His nursery was right across the hall from my bedroom at night, which felt so ironic that he was quiet because our two biological girls sleeping was never their strong suit. And I felt like during that time, like I would give anything to have a quiet baby that would sleep through mm -hmm. the night. And then here's Micah. And I go in and I realize, oh, he's not sleeping. But he's perfectly quiet, but it's for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, that's when I first noticed the sweating that would, continue. And the pediatrician, um, said, you know, he probably cried his eyes out and realized like babies, you know, they, they conserve their energy. If nobody's coming for them, they're not going to keep on crying. And so they're going to mm -hmm. stare silently at the ceiling. So Luke and I moved, you know, him from his own room into a bassinet by our bed and ironically kind of would, you know, gently poke at him like, wake up little baby, we'll be here for you. <laughs> you know? oh, yes. I would have like, oh my gosh, you know, with my girls, um, I, it just felt ironic, but, you know, different, different circumstances completely. And so, you know, I think so often as foster parents, right, like we see these signs that kids have, and it's so easy to begin to point the finger to be like, wow, you know, like here, here's this, this six month old that's already showing so many outward signs of neglect. Um, and yet in that moment, when I said, I just want to let you know, I'm rooting for you. I didn't feel any of that. I just felt like, human to human, here is someone that's struggling. And um, it didn't take long before she very courageously asked if I would supervise visits. I, the child welfare office was not that far from my house. I didn't want, um, you know, I didn't, I, I felt like I had the capability to transport him myself. And so the less new people, the better. And that also gave me an opportunity to kind of look Jennifer in the eye and say hello and goodbye and give her updates about Micah. And it wasn't mm -hmm. long before she said, Jelana, I grew up visiting my mom in the same office, mm -hmm. in the same room where I am now visiting with Micah. I hate it here. Is there any way that you could do visits with me outside of this place. And again, mm -hmm. this is my first time. I didn't know. So I said, I will, I will get back to you about that. And the caseworker said, your eyes are to remain on that baby at all times. And yes, we give you permission to, uh, to supervise visits for Jennifer. This was in an email. And she said, and by the way, if she appears under the influence of drugs or alcohol, just let me know. Well, being a little bit type A, I was like, well, how am I going to know? So like, what's the girl to do? But check out like every book about methamphetamines ever written at the public library and come home with a stack of books. And I just look back on that and I just want to roll my eyes in the back of my head at myself. Like how ridiculous, mm. you know? And it was never with a, it was never with a gotcha attitude. It was just with a, like, I want to do a good job. This feels like a really heavy responsibility. And so um, that began 150 hours of supervised visits outside of the facility. And I was able to see firsthand how much Jennifer really loved Micah. She was a darn good mom. She was attentive. And what I loved about it, what was such a gift to me was that you know, it was never like this formal, like, sit down, Jennifer, let's have coffee. Tell me all about your life. It was more like this very gentle, easy way of just learning about one another, human mm -hmm. to human. And it wasn't long before I was like, oh my gosh, if I had lived her life, there is a good chance I might be standing in her same yeah. shoes. So how would I want to be engaged with? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Jennifer stuck to the plan when the baby's father was incarcerated. And then unfortunately, every time he got out, he was like a rock around her neck that just drowned her every time. So mm -hmm. the plan, um, after two and a half years, eventually we adopted Micah and our relationship has continued throughout it, throughout the, the whole time. Um, there have been some sticky moments. There have been some 
some um, high highs and some low lows in terms of just our own relational rumbling. It has certainly not been like walking through a field of wildflowers, that's for sure. <laughs> and yet we really firmly claim one another as family and it not just family kind of an acutesy thing to say like, oh, we're family. It's as in, you know, she has lost her mother. She has lost her father. Um, she has lost her grandma. These were the three most important people in her life. Like we are her family now. So we are two moms living in the same city, raising two full biological brothers across town from one another. And, um, and in addition to that, you guys do some work together now, right? Is that right? We do. We have the privilege of connecting with Oregon state caseworkers and sharing our story, we, uh, a 90 minute version of our story. We kind of popcorn it back and forth and then we're able to um, engage their questions just to give a picture of what, you know, some unlikely collaboration can look like. So we do that on a monthly basis. Yeah. It's awesome. I love that. That's so cool. And it's such a needed thing, I think, for like the state workers to hear because so often you hear like, okay, you can have open adoption when it's a domestic infant adoption and there, you know, you have a birth mom who's willingly placing her child into care. But if it's through the foster care system, you know, people think, oh, it's not safe, you know, oh, there were drugs involved. Oh, how could you do that? You know, or there's whatever, whatever the case is, people think that, um, it can't be a safe or a good thing. And so you get real closed people get real closed off to the idea of open adoption when it comes to foster care. And so, and even, even the, the caseworkers, I mean, like, they're like, no, no. I mean, I, we've had like the little guy I talked about earlier, we were told not to give them um, the biological family. We were told when he went back into care, we should, I mean, back into their family that we shouldn't um, have any contact with them. And we're like, if they're safe to give the 18 month old child to, I think we can feel safe with them having our phone number. And so yeah. we did, you know, and it was, it's interesting because that's just the way the system is set up is like foster families over on one side, biological yeah. family on the other, and there should be no connection. And we've seen, and you've seen, it's, it's so healthy for our kids to have that connection. It is. It is. And I think, you know, when we really think about like, who's, who's child welfare involved, mm -hmm. most people are not flesh and healthy community. If they were, they wouldn't have mm. a stranger caring for their child yep. to begin with. Right. So right. I think if the agency goes in and says, how can we have the lightest touch on this family so that this child, if it's safe and appropriate, can hopefully go home as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Isn't it a beautiful holistic picture? And again, this isn't like, fairy tale land. We know that this can't happen every time, but I think more often than not, the parties can at least connect together. And I think, yeah. and sometime, you know, a lot of times, how beautiful is it when, when that foster parent can become part of that safety net so that, um, yeah. well, you know, that, that bio parent may have one person now in their corner that they can, you know, yeah. uh, trust with their child or use for respite or right. what have you. Right, because now and she's able to raise a child, right? She's raising your son's brother, and she's been she able is. to raise him very likely because having a support system is a huge part of that, you know? I mean, we it's have a, a similar part. situation. And I think it's a, it's a story of, like, never say never. I mean, mm -hmm. um, Micah was Jennifer's third child. The first two have a, a different father and they, they lived with him, but there's all, and then she went on to have a fourth child and all four of her kids have been child welfare involved. And so I remember the um, CPS worker saying, Oh my gosh, sometimes we can just tell what's going to happen by the size of the box. Like she grew up in foster care, fourth mm. child, all of her kids have been in foster care. Mm -hmm. We had just adopted Micah when she had her fourth child and they were like, well, we all know how this is going to end. And the reality was we didn't, you know, we fostered that baby and then we returned him to Jennifer at a lockdown treatment facility. And she was clean and sober for four years. And then we fostered that fourth child again for nine months and then returned him to her. And that was six and a half years ago. Um, um, and so I feel like it's a never say never type situation because, uh -huh. um, you know, we thought the writing was going to be on the wall yeah. and she's, she's been clean and sober and, um, she's, 
she's the she's the mom now that I saw glimpses of, you mm-hmm. know, fourteen years ago, thirteen and a half years ago when yeah. we first connected, you know. And um she's she's taught me so much and I think just um It's pretty impactful to see somebody that has had the level of abuse and neglect in her own life, the level of um, being failed, quite honestly, by by the foster care system and, um, you know, addiction and kind of the triple whammy of of all of that and just the courage she has to, to remain clean and sober and to parent her kids well. And I just love being able to say, like, you're a really good mom, Jennifer. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's that's a joy, awesome. honestly. One one of the reasons that story resonated with me is is because is because of of the next thing I hope we can talk about for a few minutes, and that is um, that we have you know the previous episode that we published prior to this one, we talked about open adoption. So I won't belabor it too much. If anybody wants to hear that, they can just listen to the previous episode. But we have an open adoption with our almost eighteen year old daughter's birth mom. And, and over the years, and, and it's the same thing, like we, we've, been, we've been her support system in a lot of ways, you know, and, and she aged out of the foster care system herself. Um, you know, we talked earlier about the statistics about kids who age out. Uh, she's a success story. She has, she has held down a job every single day since she aged out of the foster care system. She, did a, she spent a few, did a few semesters of college. Um, she has um, a 10-year-old uh, daughter that, that she takes care of and is raising and, and is, um, by all measure of a child that ages out of the foster care system, uh, you know, an unlikely success story because she does not much, have much of a support system. And so um, we, at the time, we, we didn't know what to expect. But I will mm-hmm. say that, that we have come to learn that it is a privilege to, to be her support system. And, and people said to us, well, she's lucky to have you. And I think early on, we probably would have said, yeah, she kind of is. But but the Lord has a good way of, 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 of working working things out, where today Kayla and I would, would say that it certainly, it, we're lucky to know her because it has, it has changed us mm-hmm. in, in profound ways. Uh, it it, it mm-hmm. has humbled us. It has, it has opened our eyes. It has helped us understand that, that that folks whose kids end up in the child welfare system it's not really as simple as everybody thinks it is and so um it's never cut and dry you know it's it's never uh can we talk a little bit how it's changed all of us yeah i mean yeah i mean i i i would certainly echo what you said i think you said it i think you said it perfectly like that proximity to those that whose who struggles are more than they can bear yeah. it is profoundly changing. And I think, you know, growing up in a faith context, I think sometimes, um, I think sometimes there can be an oversimplification of the struggle of the complexity yeah. of the nuance <clears throat> of the hurdles, you know, because it's really yeah. easy to look at something from kind of a distance and think we're seeing it clearly, but then we get up, up close and personal and we realize, Oh, it's not just as simple as getting your butt into church and stop choosing drugs over your kids and just get it together. You know, like a a lot of the kind of um, head shakingly judgy things that might be, you know, internal monologues for, for some of us. And again, you know, um, I think not every story, I want to be very clear, like not every foster or adoptive parent is meant to be living this specific storyline. But I think regardless of how that connection happens, we can still to the best of our abilities, hold our child's parents in high regard and yes. just um, honor that they are made in the image of God. And by that alone, they are owed some baseline respect in how we, we talk and approach and engage them and how we talk to our children um, about the ones who, who gave them life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think, like you said, it's it's real easy to kind of um, shake our heads and be like, oh, if you just did this or if you just did that, then, you know, this wouldn't have happened. And um, we can be very judgmental of the situations. But once you're in the situation and you you see firsthand just how hard um, these families are working or how um, 
just how the cards have been so stacked against them just based on their own early childhood, right? Like we look at our own exactly. kids and we go, oh my gosh, well, their early childhood was so hard and we, we want to do all these things to help them heal and help them get to a place where they can, um, you know, just be the amazing people God created them to be. And then we want to judge the biological family who very likely has that same early childhood experience and that very same um, early start to life or those same struggles that our kids had and nobody was there for them necessarily to help them heal and help them get to a good place. And so um, when we can see it with eyes of compassion, we can see these not, not, I feel sorry for you, you poor thing, but really with eyes of compassion of, of, wow, things have been really hard and you didn't have someone there to cheer for you. And, and like you said, I'm rooting for you, right? Like being that person in the foster care situation that says, I am rooting for you. Like, um, I want you to get your kid back. I want you to get healthy. Maybe, maybe, um, being a parent right now is not what's going to happen, but I want you to be healthy. I still, because even though you adopted Micah, you're still rooting for Jennifer, right? You still rooted yeah. for her when that next kiddo came along. And, um, and that's, and that's kind of what we've done with our daughter's birth mom. You know, when I, she called me when, when her next baby was born and I was at the hospital holding that baby and telling her what a good mom she was and how, you know, great she was going to do with it. Um, and just, being able to root for her, she has, I think, been able to um, see in herself things that maybe she never could see early on um, that are true and that are, you know, she's, she is a good mom and she is doing um, hard work. I can't imagine she's a single mom and I can't even imagine being a single mom and just how amazing she does, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Jennifer is as well. And, you know, I think it's important too. you know, in in the midst of rooting for folks, like we know that rooting for someone and encouraging them and wanting them to do well and, and holding their story with empathy does not mean that we do not have um, boundaries with them. There have been many points in Jennifer's story where I've had to say, you're not safe right now. You're using, so we are not going to have contact, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it have made it very clear that our heart is for you. We want you to do well. Um, and at this point in time, you know, this is, uh, this is not healthy for, and you know, us to engage. And so there have been, I mean, we have the majority of the time been in contact, but there have been months here and there, um, where, where we ha- have had to draw that have had to draw that boundary. And Jennifer talks about that when we share in class together about how she didn't really have that modeled for her, you know, what it looks like for someone to say, I love you. And my love for you is always going to remain here, but my trust in you or my ability to, you know, be in the same room with you right now, um, just in terms of safety wise is is down here. So for right now, we're going to need to take a little break. And we've definitely had those moments in our story and she has been angry at me and I have felt bewildered by her. I mean, there have been a lot of, a lot of ups and downs. Um, and yet I think that even, even in those hard valleys of our stories, um, there can still, you know, there can still be someone experiencing love through those, through those boundaries. Um, even I know that that's been part of our story. And um, I guess it wouldn't be an interesting story if it was just like all uphill <laughs> and everything was good. Everything was lot of always rosy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, you know, I was thinking with me was the last thing you just said there. Um, you know, whenever we talk about attachment uh, or relationships, however you want to phrase that, We talk about Jude Cassidy's four hallmarks of secure attachment. And then the fourth one is negotiating your needs, which is her way of saying um, being able to draw boundaries. And so what I love about that story is that you're able to draw a boundary. She respects it uh, for the time that it needs to be in place. And then and then and then you you reconnect in relationship really, really means that you have an actual relationship with Jennifer. And it's not just transactional. I think that's what's missing is there's a lot of transactions in child welfare. But yeah. when we actually do the work of building the relationships, 
because it's not just it's not just that Micah has a safe, loving home now. It's now that Jennifer has a reason to stay clean and to raise her her son in a safe, loving home. And so and so by 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 you walking over there one day and saying, Look, "I want you to have this picture," you know, of, of your six month old son, mm-hmm. has now led to to thirteen and a half years of you investing into this person and 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 this is the way you know people talk about gener- generational cycles and generational curses and and that's true right because a lot of times people who like like with our daughter right she ends up in the foster care system but but so so is her birth mom and so these cycles are perpetuate and and the way we break these cycles is to just invest in each other because that cycle has been broken. Her daughter's ten years old. Never, never, never been in touched the child welfare system, yeah. and so, and so that, that that's that's the exciting part about it is 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 that if you will just just take that leap of faith and walk across the courtroom and say, hey, I'm Jelana. Here's a picture, or or write a note in the diaper bag and said, my name, my name's Kayla. Here's my phone number, uh, like Kayla did that one time. Um, mm-hmm. The impacts are enormous um, from this tiny, what's or, or seemingly tiny little things in the moment and they're enormously uncomfortable because you don't know what's going to happen. Right. Um, yeah. But I want to say this though, Miss Jelana Goebel, um, that even though you have had to draw boundaries, um, we're going to post in the show notes a link to buy your book because everybody needs to read your book. Uh, and also a link to your author page on Facebook because there's a picture of you and Jennifer from May of this okay. year celebrating her 39th birthday. If anybody wants to, uh, wants to see what uh, just meet Jelana and Jennifer in that picture. I will post a, a link to that. Um, okay, it's yeah. like over 40 minutes. So is any, is Kayla, is anything burning you want to tell Jelana? Ask her, Jelana, anything you feel like you want to get out? Cause oh, there's so many just, more things we could talk about. Oh. There's so many more stories. and um, But yeah, we should probably wrap it up. I think you're, I think you're good. Okay, so uh, I love Stretched Life. Everybody buy it. Um, we'll put links in the show notes, uh, and then and then also link to your author page on Facebook so they can see you and Jennifer together. Um, I do have to tell you this uh, because I think it's a cool story, and it might make you blush. I'm good with either of those things. Uh, when just before you just before the book was released, uh, you were kind enough to call us and say, "Hey, um, the 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 public, you know, you the publisher, however that works. I don't know how that works." Um, allowed us to give five five copies of of your book away, and so one of those copies, um, the, the family that that received it, um, they they actually reached out to me, and she like read it in a weekend. She she said she couldn't put it down, and then she said, "Oh my gosh, she's amazing." And and by the way, every time you're on another podcast, they they will reach out to me and tell me that Jelana was on um, the FASD podcast. The Je- is Jeff is that his name? Jeff Noble, yes. Yeah, I, when you were on there, he sent me. They sent me the link to it because they just thought it was fantastic. Um, we need to have a whole episode for what F, F, FASD, by the way, and we cannot get I into that now. To. I mean, that's a whole nother story. And that's a whole nother that's, episode. That's, yeah, that's a whole nother episode. But yes, I have a lot. I have a lot to share about about um, parenting our youngest with with fetal alcohol syndrome. So, for sure. so these so these people now tell me, hey, she was on this podcast, blah blah blah, and I said, yeah, no, she's my friend. And they're like, what? I'm like, I, I have Jelana's telephone number. We talk on the phone. And so, just oh, so you guys. know. Thank you. Oh. You flatter me. It's like so fun to hang out with you. And, it and is. Just, uh, it's just, um, it's great. I feel like we could connect for a you know, very, very long time. So yeah. as, as we land this thing, I want to tell one more Portland story. Um, at the end, at the end of the time we were there, we, we did some training for children's ministry staff, and then we did a workshop that that you were so kind. They, they told us afterwards that we treaded the fine line between. You did, about these... and it is a fine line. You guys wrapped it. I felt like <laughs> you guys delivered. We said, "Can we? Can you do one specifically for the faith community, and can you do another presentation, kind of for everyone?" And um, you just everyone was like raving about both presentations that you did mm-hmm. excellent well yeah it was a very kind i always remember you saying that that, that you appreciated how well we finally we walked that line i'm like i guess we can do it honey uh but um <laughs> but but i remember the one thing i remember about that day is, 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 is at the end of the day uh you me kayla and brooke the four of us took a picture together and and i remember after we took the picture 
I was, I think I was standing next to you, Kayla and I was standing in the middle and I had my arm behind your back for the picture. And I said, can, can we like, can we actually be friends? Like not just like ministry <laughs> friends, but like, like for real <laughs> friends. Yeah, like for and you were friends. kind enough to say, yeah. So um, you are <laughs> a, here yeah, we are. Here we are. <laughs> we, we need to get back out of Portland, Kayla. Yes, you do. we do. We need to come back sure. out. To see, sure. just see oh. Jelana. Well, um, you are um, you are a gift, my dear, and we are so thrilled that you that you decided to tell the story and these stories in, in in this book. And and really, I, we we could not recommend and and listen. We needed a whole episode on just your resume, okay? Okay, because <laughs> yeah, we do. Because like, you know, the governor of like, Oregon no. calls her. <laughs> so I'm just saying, Jelana, uh, people need to know about you. I, look, how's, here's the deal. Here's the deal. You don't give your resume. I'll just do it. And then and then you don't feel like, I hate being that person who gives my resume. Like, you didn't. Ryan did it for you. <laughs> um, it's one of the things that we like about you. You are, um, your resume is very impressive. The things you've done in the state of Oregon are to be commended and admired. But in, in the midst of all of that, you are kind and you are humble. And, and it's some of our favorite things about you. So thank you for being our friend. Thank you for jumping on here with us. Kayla, do you want to gush about her or have I done enough for both of us? <laughs> oh my you, gosh. You've oh done plenty gosh. of gushing. I can tell. She's like, please stop. <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I will just say thank you for being my friend. Thank you for Ooh. thank you for having me on. I really appreciate you guys deeply. Mm, All right. Thanks, well, Jelana. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, we're going to jump in the green room with Jelana. So if you're a patron, listen to that. If you're not, become a patron so you can hear us talk even more. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>